Hello and welcome to Tundra Connections live chat. I am here on Buggy One, joined with Joanne Simerson. Uh, it's great to be with you. My name is BJ Kirschhofer, and I'm the Director of Conservation Technology for Polar Bears International. Um, and we are kind of wrapping up our season here in polar bear land, uh, here outside of Churchill, Manitoba, in the wildlife management area. Um, on your screen here, or what will be on your screen here shortly, is one of the last bears we may see this season uh, from the buggy. This is what we've all been hoping for and what the bears have been hoping for. Um, and this is the, the bears about to head out on the sea ice. This is kind of this land fast sea ice stuff that's, uh, that's near the coast. It may not be super productive area where they're going to be able to catch seals, but it's, it's a start. It's, uh, it's the direction that we want to see. Uh, we want to see the Hudson Bay starting to freeze so they can go out and hunt seals. We'll talk a little bit more of that. We'll kind of intermix what's happening outside the buggy window here. But first, I'd like to introduce uh, my guest today, and that is Joanne Simerson, a longtime friend of Polar Bears International. Um, she, her tenure here predates everybody on the buggy. Um, <laughs> yep. And Joanne, maybe you could tell yourself, uh, tell a little bit about yourself and uh, your history here with Polar Bears International. Sure. So, one of those, like many of us, uh, my entire life, only animals existed for me. And uh, I was very lucky to have a career in the zoo field. Um, and extremely lucky that I've worked with just about any species you can see in a zoo or aquarium. But later on in my career, I started working with bears and polar bears specifically and found them to be so intelligent, but their creativity mm -hmm. of their intelligence really got me going. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing I wanted to do was to see polar bears in the wild so that I could bring back what I observed back to increase or advance the care that, of the bears I took care of in the zoo. Super cool. Yeah. So, uh, so are polar bears your favorite bear? Don't tell giant pandas or grizzlies mm -hmm. or anything like that, but yeah, they have okay. to be. We just had to, yes. we had to, we had to make sure that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so how long have you been coming to Churchill? So the, my first trip here was in 2001, and I came as a tourist and uh, absolutely fell in love. Uh, born and raised in California, but I fell in love with this cold north and the beauty of it. Uh, of course, the polar bears were a draw, but the lifelong friends I've made up here, the beauty of the stark environment. Um, I now have spent so much time in the Arctic here, uh, north of Norway, north of Alaska, and I never get tired of the Arctic colors. Mm -hmm. So I'm in love with this area. And yeah, so this is my, you know, 20th season up here in Churchill, well. just in the fall. And if you've been paying attention to the cams, we always do try to highlight the, the sunsets, uh, the sunrises. And uh, I would agree that the colors here are unbelievable. Stunning. And I think, you, you know, it's not a landscape that has uh, giant mountains, maybe like Svalbard or, um, you know, there aren't big trees right here on the coast. There's, you, you have to look a little bit harder, I think. Um, but when you start noticing the small details here and really concentrating on kind of the weather and the, yeah. what the sky is doing, this place, it, it is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Truly. And then you add the animals on top. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty special. It's pretty special, yeah. for sure. Maybe you could describe just a little bit, like, what are, we, what are we looking at outside the window here? So maybe KT can pop the cam on again. What's, you know, what is this dark sky, this white ice? What's, what's happening out there? Yeah. So this is, this is Churchill in its essence of the contrast between the bright white snow, the different colors of the ice from, we can look out here and we can see white ice, we can see gray ice. That's actually just as solid. In fact, that bear that you see on the camera right now, it, he's walking on ice, but it's gray in color. And then the, the reflection of the dark skies, it's so dramatic, but in the middle of it is that little buttery dot that's it's it's just wonderful and of course over the past week or so we've watched it turn from snow and extending that ice all the way out to the horizon mm -hmm. which is a happy time for all of us it's a happy time so these bears here polar bears they don't want to live on land um, if you see pictures of polar bears with bushes in the background or they're they're on land they're on land because there isn't ice out there for them to be on 
Um, this time of year in, in Churchill, the bears are gathering on shore and they're waiting for this sea ice to build so they can go out and hunt their favorite food seals. Uh, their primary food source. So this is this is really what we've all been waiting for. It's not great for cam viewers when we have bears so far away, Little but it tough. is. But if you want uh, polar bears on into the future, this is exactly what we need. We need these bears to be able to get out and uh, and, and catch yeah. some seals. Yeah. So we're getting yeah. there, aren't we? Yeah, we're yep. getting there. It's yep. good. It's good. It's very good. So so you said you first came here as a tourist. Um, did you did you jump on a tundra buggy and just uh, go out and, and see some bears? Is that yeah, is that how pre you got your pretty start? much. Yeah. Uh, I actually I I investigated what was what was the best way to get to see polar bears and actually watch them. I mm -hmm. didn't want to just drive and around and things like that. So yeah, I I came out on a Cape trip. Oh wow! I start I started big, went straight out to Cape Churchill. Um, I will always remember the very first polar bear I ever saw it was a great big huge male that had one eye. Oh, and we, wow. nick we nicknamed him One-Eyed Jack, and for four years in a row, he came to visit every time, and it was so wonderful to see him. What I realized was what a special experience that was, and so I started trying to think of other ways of getting my colleagues in zoos that worked with polar bears. What could I do to get them to come up here? Because every time I was up here, I learned Oh, these bears out here in the wild teach you so much. Mm -hmm. And I could bring that back to the bears that we had at the zoo I worked mm -hmm. at. And the response those bears had to those ideas was wonderful. So after uh, I, I actually wasn't involved with Polar Bears International at that time. Um, Polar Bears International was actually in a transition mm -hmm. from Polar Bears Alive to Polar, to Bears, Polar Bears International. Bears International. So it was actually the perfect timing because both the organization and myself were looking for growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that was when we came up with the ambassador program, which was originally called Infield Lectures. Mm -hmm. But we realized the impact that we made on the guests, the staff, uh, the team from Frontiers North and Tundra Buggy Adventures, we were all becoming ambassadors for this amazing area. And so, although the program started as Infield in Lectures in 2005, within two years we had changed it to more fitting of what that program had become. So, you know, maybe not the first year, but as it matured, maybe you could describe a little bit about what the role of these ambassadors yeah. were. You know, what, what was their day-to-day -day like? What, yeah. what were they doing? So one of the goals um, was that we, I, I wanted to develop opportunities for women in the zoo profession, specifically polar bear keepers, to develop leadership skills. So that was a big mission of the program, was not only to come up here and learn about polar bears and to develop some street cred, mm -hmm. but then go home with that street cred and be able to be looked at in your zoo as a polar bear expert mm -hmm. with knowledge that no one else would have. Mm -hmm. And we've been maintaining that for very long. When we first started, there was four of us a year and we covered five weeks. Uh, this year, I, I've lost track of how many weeks, and we've had well over 20. We were expanded from zookeepers to doctoral students. But the idea is we would start off going on tender buggies, mm -hmm. uh, working so closely with the drivers and guides from Frontiers North, and we just talked about polar bears. Mm -hmm. And our goal on those buggies was when our guests left this area and they went to their local zoo and they saw the polar bears, that somehow that was making that connection. As we started to focus more and more on climate change, our messaging started getting more and more in that direction. Mm -hmm. So we went from just explaining what a polar bear was to nowadays, we're bringing in the latest research, the latest numbers. Everybody that is an ambassador out here has done something to impact polar bear conservation. And we bring our own personal stories mm -hmm. and the idea is to that by the time we get up in front of a buggy to do a talk we've developed a relationship with each person that comes out here mm -hmm. and when you take most animal people we're not people people but it's been such a wonderful way to have these conversations and feel like we're really making an impact for conservation with polar bears beyond just the trip that guests have here mm -hmm. 
So yeah, so you're spending time with the people in yeah. the environment, helping yeah. interpret what's going on, yeah. and then all the while learning and being able to bring that back yeah. to the community. Of, of course, a few years ago, that expanded to the interpretive center yeah. in town. Mm -hmm. So now we get double the time. We're out here on the buggy having wonder, being, there's nothing more thrilling than being with someone when they see their first polar bear. But we also get to talk with them in town. It's, it's the expansion of it. It's gone so far beyond my original goal of developing a leadership program for women in zoos and to find a way of making an impact for polar bear conservation. Yeah, it's really neat to have seen this program grow. Yeah. I grew. I started with Polar Bears International back in 2007. Um, and so to be able to see the program progress, and now that we have another venue, uh, in Churchill, Manitoba, Polar Bears International has uh, an interpretive center, a place where people can come. And this is just anybody that wants to pop in. Community yep. members, uh, folks, uh, you know, popping off the train, um, any one of the tour companies, anybody that comes through town is welcome to the house and, uh, and can come learn about polar bears, learn about what's happening, get the most up-to-date knowledge. And so we're able to get onto the buggy and meet with people and also yep. meet in our own house there, which yeah. is, it's pretty special. And when you think about, we've had uh, ambassadors from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, they're zookeepers, doctoral students. Uh, some ha aren't necessarily polar bear researchers, but they, it's ice and climate mm -hmm. and seals. And, but everybody, it all focuses back on the bear. On the and, and the other part of that is the network of those of us that have been up here. We now have a shared experience. And... The, those relationships help each other. Uh, there's been countless researchers that have called me and said, hey, have you ever noticed this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and quite honestly, from some of the things that we've observed out here, some of the very first polar bear research in zoos was developed. Mm -hmm. So you said, like, first off, you, you kind of did your research and you wanted to go to the Cape with Frontiers North because you wanted to sit and, and watch bears yeah. like you wanted to you wanted to have the full experience the slow experience yeah. you wanted to see everything and does that come from some of your your behavioral background it, is that is that why yeah you know when when you're my parents were very disappointed i didn't go to vet school they 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 kind of thought if she's going to love animals she needs to do something like that yeah but i i learned with working with vets and and starting that whole process that i really wanted to work with animals not necessarily on them, sure. and certainly the, the veterinary field has changed dramatically since way back then. But I really started, I, so I ended up with a degree in behavioral science. And so every experience I've had in life, um, that's the eye with which I look. And so much in conservation, we concentrate on the population as a whole. And some of the greatest joy I've had is in watching the individual animals out here with their personalities, which anyone who works in a zoo and works closely with all these amazing animals, we can tell you they all have different personalities. Mm -hmm. So of course they do with these wild bears. And so that's one of the things we'll probably talk a little bit about is some of the personalities I've seen out here. Well, and that's what I want to transition to a little bit. I mean, you've, you've spent decades here in the Arctic. You've had some super cool experiences um, and part of that's just being an observer, being here to, to see what's going on yeah. and, uh, and kind of interpret it. And I wonder if you could share some of your favorite moments with us a little bit, and, and maybe we could start with, with the rock bear. Okay, the rock bear. Okay. So this, this, this was, um, I was out here as a naturalist with a group, and it was very early season. It was uh, early October and uh, no snow, no ice, and we were driving around the willows, and we come around a corner, and there's this beautiful young um, female polar bear. She's standing on a rock, her head is down, and she's got saliva dripping from her mouth. And everybody is just going, oh, she must be sick. Mm. And she stood there, and then the next thing I know, she bobbed her head up and down. Now remember, we are nowhere near any water. I, and I say, she's hunting. And everyone looks at me like, Joanne has lost it. Mm -hmm. But sure enough, this little bear, the reason she was salivating is because she was hunting. She was standing there, and you could see her tilt her head side to side, listening. She would fly off the rock, land on the, and with her paws on the ground, and she'd come up 
chewing on a no either way. a lemming or a vole. No way. And she did it multiple times. Unbelievable. The same thing. And so from my zoo bears, I know when they would get excited about things, the head bobbing back and forth and uh -huh. bouncing. And yep. that's what she would do is she would hear one, she'd follow it, yep. and then she'd do the bounce and fly off the rock. Yep. And, you know, the reality is she wasn't getting much nutrition from that. Sure. But what a clever girl. Clever girl. And she's maybe she's honing some of her hunting skills, whatever. Well, yeah. and then, so... If not long after that, um, we were approached to see if we could identify what polar bear's hearing range was mm -hmm. so that we could better manage the denning areas up off the North Slope in Alaska. Yep. And just by watching this bear and seeing, and as you, as you said, observing, mm -hmm. no interference, no anything, no. just observing, to watch how she was actually using her hearing because for polar bears with their sense of smell, they, they first see the world usually with their nose. With their nose, yeah. So when I had to develop how do we train polar bears to tell us what they hear, it was like, how do I communicate this to the bear? I want you to be listening mm -hmm. versus something else. And just like this little bear, when she got excited about hearing something, when we did the hearing study and we got to the more difficult tones, and our bears correctly identified, I heard the tone. They would bounce, like, I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. That's pretty cute. And so it was, it was such a wonderful way to see, we want to give back to the wild bears, mm -hmm. but so do our bears. And now, guess what? They're also the ambassadors. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. It's so, such a great story to tell. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, when you think about kind of their head shifting and hearing. I mean, you see our dogs do that, oh. you know, too. Or, or if you're watching foxes, I mean, just about anything that's kind of hunting in long grass or, or something like yeah. they're going to do that. They're going to do that same behavior. It's super yeah. cool. Yeah. So um, I wonder if we can talk a little bit, mm, too, about this, uh, the sniffing paw study that you were yeah. involved with and, and kind of how that got started. Okay. So, you know, there's, it, there's lots of us that come up here. There's many of us that, that work in zoos and research, and one of the greatest things is to come out and watch the bears here in Churchill because you get such a chance to observe. One of the things that we thought was kind of odd is that as the bears intermingle and travel around, um, they're not sniffing where, where, like, animals often smell where another animal has urinated or defecated. And so often with the polar bears, they were sniffing paw prints. And it wasn't just males sniffing female prints, it's sub-adults sniffing every... And we started developing this idea, is there something happening mm -hmm. in the feet mm -hmm. that there's communicating going on? Right. Um, polar bears don't have territories to mark, and if a female is getting ready to breed, she's out on the ice and the ice is constantly shifting. So even though she might have urinated here, it doesn't tell the male anywhere of where she's gone. Right. So again, by ob observing the bears out here and watching what they're just doing, mm -hmm. it was like, okay, what's going on with the feet? So we started training our bears um, so that we could swab their paws. We could track where they were in their estrus or reproductive cycles. We did it on males and females. And then this was one of the first times that there was huge collaboration. And it was put together by Polar Bears International, which is where we all gather and, mm -hmm. and chat. But our wild colleagues were doing this with bears that they were handling in the wild, taking urine samples and paw samples. And then researchers worked with endocrinologists and identified that there truly is something happening with the paws, that the scent changes, but they don't have scent glands. Right. It's uh, the ethocrine glands, which we have in our hands, uh -huh. and so the bears are following what's in that scent. And it's not just a male finding a female, but it's a female finding a male, sub-adults knowing to stay away from this area. And I always think about, and then I tell this on the buggy when I'm telling the story, is can you imagine if that is how we found our dates? Yeah. You'd go to a bar, you'd shake a hand, and you'd sniff no. your paw and go, sorry. Yeah. And then you'd shake another hand and go, well, hello. Yeah. But it's always... Um, you know, we always apply human characteristics totally. to what we see, but it's kind of fun to switch it around. Oh, absolutely. But it yeah. makes total sense when you look yeah. out at this landscape, and we're only getting, when you, when you switch to the outside cam here, we're only just getting a small fraction of how big this place is. But you look from, from horizon to horizon here, this place is huge. It is. And if you're trying to 
if you're trying to find a friend or stay away from somebody, I mean, you got there has to be a way to do it. And I think yeah. the paw print, uh, it's brilliant, yeah. you know, because, I mean, these prints are going to stay in the snow for, for long periods for a long of time. time. And so you're going to bisect these tracks inevitably as a bear moving around yeah. and being able to sniff a print and tell who's out there, yeah. whether or not you want to follow it or stay away. Is, yeah. It's brilliant. And critically, you mm -hmm. know, uh, there, this, this is the best studied population in the world totally. of polar bears. A yep. lot of it because of the access. Right. But the more we find out about polar bears, the more we're finding out we don't know. And yeah. one of the critical things to start trying to identify is as the ice disappears, what beyond the grocery store disappearing mm. for polar bears, what other impact does that have? I and mean, when so you say grocery store, that's the sea ice that's where they the can shop ice. for their their For the ice. hunting, right? yeah. Totally. Yep. Right? Yep. So now we realize that the sea ice is also, um, you know, it's we, their we, email. It's, it's their. The, it's the Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, yeah. It's you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, as time goes on, and and it's so critical that we, just as this is a well-studied population because of its access, polar bears that we have in zoos are easy access to train amazing things, mm -hmm. and certainly you can go onto the Polar Bears International website and see where this zoo research now has just taken off. Oh, totally. And, and I will tell you, when we first started training for the paw swab, there was a lot, you can't do that, polar bears are too dangerous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're not going to do that. No. And I have, j again, back to my first why polar bears started being my favorite, yeah. is how they're, they use their heads. Yeah. And they're the only bear species that hunting is the... Uh, primary way of gaining sustenance. Mm -hmm. So to be able to train them, they love this kind of training. So it's very rewarding. So how do you how do you get a paw swab from a from a polar bear? I mean, that's pretty that's pretty wild. How do you train um, that? What do you do? So you know everything we train is all with positive reinforcement and a step of approximations. In its most basic form, it's how we learn to read. You learn the alphabet first, and then once mm -hmm. you you know words, you can read simple books onto massive novels, right? And so once you have a foundation with a polar bear of training, all, simply all we did is we had them lay down and then we would just put our hands there and there's always barriers between right, us. Right, right. And we'd just say, paw. And they just would put their paw like this and through here. And then we simply took a swab and just swabbed in between. And that was it. How long does it take to train a bear to do that? Like oh. we're talking weeks, months, days? Usually one training session. That's crazy. The, because the foundation is important. You want to come over and help right? me train my dog? I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it is it's about understanding your the your and you and you can do this with any animal. You get the proper foundation, mm -hmm. and so many animals they just want to learn. It's a natural process, and we're going to talk a little bit about when I the time I've spent in the dens. Yeah, yeah. And what a wonderful time that was for me just to watch mom teaching cubs that are just coming out of the den. Let's let's move to that. Um, okay. Let's talk about Wachee Lodge. So there's a there's a very important denning area not far from where we sit here actually. It's just south of here and you've spent a lot of time there haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Again. In this polar bear yes. denning area? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Again. I uh, somewhat obsessed in uh, in spending time in every possible part of a polar bear's life that I can learn mm -hmm. about. And yeah, very, very lucky to go out to Wachee Lodge, um, just southeast, uh, southwest of here, yeah. uh, where the bears are denning. And to, it's regularly minus 50, wind blowing. Um, and the folks out there that run the lodge scout and we, uh, the bears den on the uh, lake fronts. Yeah. And we stand on the frozen lakes at yeah. a good distance and these lake fronts, nearest. there's like these uh, these lakes out there with these these bluffs that build up, yeah. right? So it's kind of a, a, a lake that's been sunken yeah. within the peat almost, right? Yeah, yeah. well, and, and in this area, um, so if a uh, female bear dens on the pack ice, the snow builds up and she builds right into the snow, usually in an ice ridge. Mm -hmm. But here, because the ice doesn't build up till later in the season, mm -hmm. um, they dig into the frozen peat. Yep. And then the snow builds up around it, and they do it all the the banks around the the lakes, and so and it's only certain banks where the snow is going to pile up because of how the wind blows here. So we go and we stand um, on a lake uh, with 
at a great distance with huge lenses. And probably a lot of snow clothes, right? Oh. You got your heavy boots on. It, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, it's amazing. And I, and I tell folks who are interested in doing this trip, I say it is the most miserable trip you <laughs> yeah. will ever do. Yeah. Um, frostbite, fingers don't move, you're yeah. frozen. But it's the most amazing thing when you see a head pop up. Mm. All of a sudden, you're not cold anymore. Yeah. You're not. Uh, it's just, it's a fantastic thing. I think you're thing. seeing some of that now on, yeah. the, on the screen. So the, the photo here is... Um, uh, what usually happens is we see a disturbance where a mom is poking her head up. And first thing is, as she comes up, she sticks her nose up and she will come out several times without any cubs. And she's just looking around. And then when she feels it's a good time and she's taking care of her needs, mostly rubbing in the snow and things like that, she sticks her head down and she goes <laughs> and she calls the cub up. I, I can't even tell you what it feels like when a polar bear cubs sees the sky for the very first mm. time in his life right um and first of all they're going mom you're crazy it's cold out yeah, here yeah. um but there's a, this is where the teaching process starts mm -hmm. is she's going to stay in that den and she's looking for a few things how well is my cub obeying what I say yep. because once she gets going there's dangers out there sure. there's cub needs to when mom says run run cub stays nearby um, the other thing that's really interesting is when they first come out their back legs barely work <laughs> and they're really scrawny and skinny yep. and you just watch for the few days the muscle is building up Sure. And so it makes sense, and sure. we know this from um, polar bear cubs born in zoos, that for the first two and a half months, those back legs aren't, well, they don't need them in a den, There's right? nowhere to go, right? But they can... Their only job is to grow. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what they do, yeah. and then when they start coming out of the den, so she's looking for them to acclimate to the weather, get those back legs, build that mm -hmm. through running, climbing, jumping on her, and that anytime she says back in the den... They go in fast. Better listen to mom. Yeah. Um, as they're getting ready to leave, she will journey out a little ways, and she'll turn around and come, go back in the den. Um, and just watching that whole thing going on, and when she makes that decision, I think you're, you're seeing how mom's playing with them. And them up on the bluff um, and us down on the, the lake bed, so you, that's really nice when you're looking up. At yeah, them, it totally. gives a better idea. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things that's really emotional, if you've spent you know a few days with this, is uh, when mom decides, okay, my cub is obeying, my cub is acclimated, and my cub is physically ready to do this. And she usually starts with her nose up in the air, and off they walk. That's it. And just as we were saying, we're so happy to see the bears now here on the ice. Even though it's like, oh, I came all this way and this bear is now left. Yeah. But it's, that's what we want to see. That's what we want to see. Mom's gone a long time without eating. It's time a to long go. Long time. It's time for her to go get a And meal. think about it. The cub is about to experience meat for the first time oh, yeah. in his life. Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. Yeah. What a special that's time. Really cool. What a special thing. So yeah. we're actually getting a lot of comments on the photos here. And a lot okay. of these photos are Joanne's. Maybe all yes. of them are. All that, of them. Yep. Yeah. That KT's showing. So um, people love your photos. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. It's very cute to see. I mean, it's hard to beat the cuteness of a oh, new polar bear cub. Yeah. I mean, it has to be one of the cutest things yeah. on the planet. It's, well, and, and again, um, I think we're going to show, show some pictures of some of the play stuff that happens while um, at the denning areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we talk so much about sparring males. And, uh, it, you know, well, you can see in the picture that's up right now, it starts really early. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, so as, again, as we try and figure out why do males spar? Well, I see females spar out here. Yeah. And for what purpose are cubs sparring? Well, they're building their muscle. Sure. But maybe it's just fun. Yeah. Um, sure. Watching, one of the things I love to do because of my behavior background is everybody wants to know, is it a male or a female cub? Yeah. And I try using only behavior to determine gender mm -hmm. and understanding what an adult polar bear's life is like. So for male polar bears, their survival is about brawn. Yep. And for female polar bears, it's not just their survival. 
but they have to assess danger. They have to teach their cubs, so they take care of themselves and that. So my little theory is, is that if you watch a polar bear cub and they investigate their world through brawn, yep. it's most likely a male. Uh -huh. If a cub investigates by sitting, watching, and maybe using their brain a bit. Okay, what are you saying here? Um, I'm just saying, yeah, okay. perhaps yeah. it's a female. Um, only to be confirmed if you see them urinate. Yep. And uh, I've got about a 98% success rate. That's pretty based good. Based only on behavior. Very cool. Not that I'm making any no, no. comments here. Totally but understand. Yeah. Just. Um, I love it. So, we've got, <laughs> so since we're talking about the cub side of things, let's talk about the other end of life. Like how long, Magnolia, nine years old, is asking, uh -huh. how long can polar bears live? How old is an old polar bear? Oh, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you look at people. Uh -huh. How how long can a human live? Yeah. So, um, and we've been discussing this, that, you know, the oldest polar bear that was documented in a zoo was 42. That's I, old. I personally took care of two female polar bears. One was 36, one was 38. Wow. Um, uh, males don't tend to live as long, but they are that much larger than the females. Mm -hmm. In the wild, we, we don't really know. Yep. We have averages. Yep. So we know that a male polar bear pretty much into their 20s, that's, that's reaching that's there. It's going to be an old bear. Females, mid-20s. Yep. That being said, some of our colleagues that have been researching bears in the wild for years have seen females that they know are 30 years old that still have cubs. Wow, that's so incredible. It, what we do know, just from the research that they're having, is that it's getting it dip more and more difficult. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. in any population, your most vulnerable are your oldest and your youngest. Yeah. What's great, though, to understand is for a polar bear, from the time they're born to the time they reach about five years of age, it's a rough, it's a rough, mm -hmm. rough go. It's about 50% in the best of times. Yeah, success rate or survival yeah. rate. Yeah. But once they reach five, that success rate of surviving goes up way into the 90 percentile. Wow. So, so if you can live that long, if you can make it to five, yeah. then likely you're, you're, doing gonna, good. you're gonna likely live to be an old bear. And from my perspective, yep. it's all about mama's teaching yep. and their learning and then they're putting those skills to use. So listen to your mother, that's the lesson There you here. go. I like it. <laughs> listen to your teachers. <laughs> yeah, to your teachers, I like it for sure. Yeah. I, I like it a lot. Um, so you know, I, I oh, want to just tell another story because uh, when we were talking about the sparring bears, one of the funniest things I ever saw um, was we had two male bears sparring and uh, they were just going at it. And one of them just hauled off and hit the other one right in the chest. Uh -huh. And he just fell, instantly fell onto the ice. And all of us watching that were just going, oh, he what didn't, happened? he didn't move. Yeah. We were anticipating, and you can, there's a picture that's gonna come up that's gonna show, he didn't move. Did he puncture his heart? Did he, right. and his play buddy walked over and to put his neck to check on him and go, dude, yeah. what's going on? And just as he leaned over him, the guy that was laying down reached up with that big pot and just gave him a huge big little whack. swipe right in the head, oh, and man. off they went to sparring again. What do they, why do they do that? I don't know. There's so much fun. It's very cool. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Hmm. Yeah. So we actually have some friends tuning in. Robert and Carolyn Buchanan have tuned in. And Hello. Yeah, and they, <laughs> they want to know, you know, what is it about the polar bear that makes them so magnificent? What is it that... that makes them what they are. Um, I just have to go back to their creativity. Mm -hmm. And I see it in every wild bear I watch. I see it um, in every zoo bear I've worked with. Um, I think that was, for me, to see how much creativity these bears use in the wild made me identify that as a component we were maybe not providing for them in zoos mm -hmm. because you want to take the best care of them so you provide everything but maybe we need to give them some challenge maybe we need to you know I uh, we had this stash pipe in one of our pools and, uh, and this we is had like a, this is something you can pass things through to the bears or what does this no it, it actually was supposed to deliver live fish into the pool okay. but it didn't work okay. like we had hoped yeah, yeah. anyways but the bears started using that that when we would ask them to come off exhibit if they had a toy out there that they wanted to keep playing with before they would run off exhibit to come to us to their bedrooms they would stash the toy in there no because way. they knew we could not reach you it. couldn't get it no 
And then when they were done playing with it, all of a sudden it would be someplace we could. That's but, super funny. And then you look at, at bears out here. So I was in Svalbard last summer, and there was a female bear that was picking up big ice chunks and just throwing them up in the air and making them splash in the water and diving in the water and picking them up mm -hmm. and bringing them back up and picking another one. Why? Why? Yeah. You know, Why? and there is the the tale of polar bears picking up ice blocks to use to kill seals. Crazy. There's I don't believe there's any story out there that doesn't have some basis of observation mm -hmm. in it. Totally. Yeah. So we're seeing I mean I think the cameras, the explore.org cameras are another great way to watch bears. It's such a neat opportunity to be able to you know, pop in and these places are hard to get to, they're expensive to get to, not yeah. everybody is, is uh, you know, able to do it, but the, the cameras, Explore.org cameras are able to allow people to pipe in all around the world to see all kinds of different wildlife and really yeah. not have an impact on, on the surroundings. You're not, you're not there, you're kind of disrupting things, you're just there as yeah. this passive silent yeah. observer. So we're seeing on the, um, someone commented yesterday that they saw bears on the Cape Cam walking in the footprints of someone that came before them, putting their feet yeah. exactly in the same spot. It it's, it's uses less energy to mm -hmm. walk like that. And I, I will admit, so, uh, you know, I came here, my first year was 2001. I came every year. And then when the pandemic hit, I was on explore.org every day because I miss it. Yep. And now one of, this is my, my last year up mm -hmm. here. I am very well aware of what I will be doing next fall. Yep. Checking in on the cams. Tuning in on the cams. 100%. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. Definitely go to the explore.org website, check it out. Um, like I say, we're going to be wrapping up the polar bear cams here in the next few days, but there's cams all over the world. Definitely check those out. Yeah. Also special from here is the Aurora cam. Yeah. So we are just entering into prime Aurora season. It's starting to get a little bit darker here. As the bay freezes, it'll take that moisture out of the air and we'll have more clear nights. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're entering Aurora season here. So be sure to check out the Aurora cam um, as, uh, as that's about to yeah. start heating up here. Yeah. We have a few more questions here. Okay. I, I, wonder, I wonder about this too. So I, I got the great opportunity to actually go to Katmai and help explore on another one of their cameras there, the brown bear cam. Mm -hmm. And and I noticed that the bears there, some of the bears had parasites. They had uh, tapeworms, or I assume some sort of worm. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, that was a shocker. I'd never seen that up here. Do polar bears have the same issues with parasites? Do well, you know? You know they, they can. Yeah. Um, certainly they can. But that's one of the things that has us concerned about this environment. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the Arctic compared to every place else is not conducive to parasites growing. Right. Um, not much survives out the window Not out much there, does. And, and that is one of our concerns, is what happens mm -hmm. as this place warms. And we, and we do see, you know, when I first came out here, we never saw red fox out here. Mm -hmm. It was only Arctic fox. Mm -hmm. well, we see a lot of red fox out here yeah. now. Especially this year. Especially this year. So what do they bring from, and of course there are grizzlies that are moving into this area. So historically, polar bears have not carried much of the traditional parasites that you see in wild bears. In fact, we know that there's a parasite that grizzlies get from eating salmonid, right. like trout, salmon, um, that they, primarily in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. that doesn't bother them. And we did lose a polar bear uh, Ooh, in a zoo, really? trying to feeding them live trout as a fun thing to do, right. but they were not equipped to handle that parasite. Oh, interesting. So it's again a little bit of something that we don't we don't know much about. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and when we talk about even how polar bears hunt and the food that they get, you know, we all know it's all about the seal. And one of the opportunities that I had. Uh, was to actually see a young male polar bear hunt on the Svalbard sea ice. No way. Do we? It, did you cap, capture it by chance? Oh yeah. Oh, do we have it? <laughs> we do. No way. Yeah, we do. Maybe we should watch um, it. And it was and it was really funny because uh, it, for all the observation, you know, he was wandering along the ice and and he would stop at a place and he'd punch through and you know he'd come up and without anything and he kept coming over and closer and closer to our ship 
And these are, and this series of photos you're seeing now is, yeah. is this bear, right? This is yeah, this, this is the bear. Yep, yep. And then you're going to see that he, we were so excited because he just picked this nice little ice ridge and he just laid down. We're going, isn't that nice that he's 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 just posing for us? Yep. But let, remember the story about the rock bear eating the lemons? Yep. Well, all of a sudden he's he's laying there still as can be and he starts cocking his head back and forth. Mm. And I'm going, I'm not going to make the same mistake thing yeah. of saying he's hunting yeah but the next thing we know he he gets going and he just starts running and you'll just see this the sequence of this and 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 at this point we're going can't be we're not really going to see this so is a bear the, off the ground right now is it yes, flying through yes. the air all four all four feet are off the ground and all of that weight tipped forward yep. punched all the way through he oh was he was butt up in in the hole so it's spinning, like sunk through all sunk the way through, the way through yep. spinning in there and like a cork. and we're going did he get it did he get it and well you'll see what oh my gosh payday for that yeah there, right there yeah wow. that's and amazing it was just and it was, it was it was the most amazing thing to watch. Mm. Um, yes, we, we rarely felt that. see that here. No, I mean, in all the years that I've been up here, you know, every yeah. once in a while that they you yeah. get to see them hunt or, or catch a seal, but yeah. rarely is it in the ice yeah. like that. That is so neat. And and I think you know we concentrate so much on the polar bear eating, yep. but the polar bear as the top predator also feeds the rest of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And you saw in that last picture all the gulls that made use. And, and one of the ways we often find polar bears out in the pack ice is we're looking for gulls, specifically ivory gulls, yep. um, because they, they're, they follow the bears. Sure. And um, you know, here if a bear gets a kill at, it caught in the tide, yep. um, the fox benefit, the, the ravens, ravens, gulls, yep. er, you know, so, it, again, just as the sea ice platform is more than just the grocery store for a polar bear, it's their internet. What else is it for not just the polar bear, but every other Everything species? Everything else. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. They're doing yeah. the shopping for, for everybody yeah. else at the grocery store. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty important. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Joanne. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you here today and, of course, over all these years. Thank and you. it's thank you for sharing your stories with <laughs> us today and sharing your pictures with us and kind of talking us through some of the things that are going on up here. So it's, awesome. it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I think we'll spend the rest of our day here watching this bear. I would love that. Yeah, it sounds great. Well, thanks, okay. everybody, for tuning in. Robert and Carolyn, it's great to hear you out there. Mm -hmm. Thanks for tuning in and uh, have a great day. Bye now. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. A polar bear's life cycle is almost exclusively tied to the sea ice. Because polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt, to breed, and sometimes to den, sea ice loss from climate change is their biggest threat, and the reason the bears are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list of threatened species. What we learn about climate change impacts on polar bears in Hudson Bay can be applied across the Arctic to help conserve other populations. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. When Arctic waters are cold enough, the top layer freezes into a special type of ice called sea ice. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. It supports the entire Arctic food chain. Food from this marine ecosystem also sustains northern communities. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. 
In the meantime, we can directly participate. Hi, 